Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy learning. Today we are gathered for the day two of the online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order. Organized weekly every Friday of September, happening since the 9th of the month. This training course is being organized by the Frederick Ebert Stiftung India Office and the Gender Impact Studies Center, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. According to the International Center for Research on Women, feminist foreign policy is a policy of a state that defines its interactions with other states and movements in a manner that prioritizes gender equality and enshrines that the human rights of women and other marginally, historically marginalized groups allocate significant resources to achieve that vision and seeks through its implementation to disrupt the patriarchal and male dominated power structures across all of its levels of influence, which includes aid, trade, diplomacy, and defense. It also includes informed voices of feminist activists, groups, and movements. So this course broadly provides the participants of a nuanced perspective on the challenges towards gender equality, locally, nationally, regionally, and globally, and advocates that the voices against the gender biases, they must be made more vocal, which would steadily aim towards the elimination of exclusive masculine agencies over a period of time. So the program themes that are specifically curated for this program are gender, peace, and security, which was covered last Friday. Today, the theme of the discussion is on gender dimensions of the UN Security Council. The forthcoming weeks, the themes include gender and sustainable development discourses, gender, international relations, and diplomacy. The chair of this program is Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished Professor Impri, and eminent economist and feminist scholar. This course is being conducted by various expert resource persons comprising well-known academicians, ambassadors, and feminist peace educators who have great experience gained in the field along with their expertise. Dr. Swarna Raja Gopalan, she joined us last week. We have Dr. Wahida Nainal, independent researcher, gender consultant, who is our distinguished expert for today's session. Welcome, ma'am. Professor Roxana Marinescu, Professor, Faculty of International Business and Economics, Department of Modern Languages and Business Communication, Bucharest University of Economic Studies. Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Meenal Srivastav from the Athabasca University, Canada, Ambassador Anil Trigunayan, Professor Nilima Srivastav from IGNU. The conveners of this program are Ms. Jyoti Rawal from FES India. Dr. Simi Mehta and Dr. Arjun Kumar from IMPRI. I welcome you all to this deliberation and I thank you for being interested and uh, putting your time, energy and efforts into understanding the emerging dimensions of the impacts of policies in promoting gender equality and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants to this course for impactful policy research and action. As mentioned, the course outline and reading resources are available on the event page for your kind perusal. So before we start today's session two, I would like to just remind all of you the housekeeping announcements. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Share your questions on the Q&A box only and not on the chat box. Please do not post as an anonymous attendee. Please identify yourself. Ensure that the questions are precise and refrain from, from making general comments uh, in the questions to save time. So now without further ado, let us start the program and it is on my honor to invite Professor Vibhuti Patel to start the program with her opening remarks um, and invite Professor Nainal after that. Thank you so much, ma'am. Over to you. Before that, we can go to uh, Jyoti, ma'am, for the introduction. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, Jyoti, ma'am, over to you. 
Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Semi Mehta, for this wonderful introduction of the webinar series of the first webinar session that we had last Friday and of uh, the sessions that are planned. It's, uh, you know, really refreshed our memories and also set the tone for our webinar for today. So dear Dr. Vahida Nainan, dear Dr. Vibhuti Patel, dear Dr. Arjun Kumar, dear participants, on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, it is my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the second session of uh, the FES IMPRI webinar series. A big thank you to the IMPRI team and to Dr. Vibhuti Patel that we are gathered here in this room and these discussions are possible. Thank you. A very special welcome goes out to our key speaker today, Dr. Vahida Nainan, on this session on gender dimension of the UN Security Council. Thank you so much, ma'am, for speaking to us, for sharing your experiences, and most of all, thank you for your generosity. Feminist foreign policy primarily aims at promotion of values and good practices to achieve gender equality and to guarantee that all women enjoy their fundamental rights. The practice initiated in Sweden uh, by the former uh, Swedish Foreign Affairs Minister, Margaret Wallström. And uh, as we also know that Sweden was the first country to have adopted a feminist foreign policy way back in 2014, which was followed suit by Canada, France, Luxembourg, Germany, Libya. And we know that this is an approach that look, looks at feminist rights and feminist issues, not just from the point of view of these being issues of a specific gender, but more as human rights issues. In the fast changing realm of international relations and foreign policies, we know that countries do not have permanent uh, alliances or uh, partnerships, but countries do have permanent interests. And to be in the pursuit of gender justice and a society wherein all genders get uh, equal, uh, let's say, uh, space to be sharing uh, their views and uh, to be participating in the political processes. We see that there's an urgent need to be looking at our policies, both uh, domestic policies as well as foreign policies with the gender lens. We are aware that in the Indian context, despite a constitutional mandate which provides for equality, patriarchal mindsets continue and there is a certain amount of uh, uh, ingrained societal and gender norms which continue to hamper the path to equality. Over the years, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, as an organization which is committed to the values of social democracy, has tried to address the aspect of gender equity through its various activities. FES is one of the oldest foundations of Germany dedicated to the principles of peace, solidarity, and social justice. From our core mission of promoting social justice, we derive the leitmotif for our work on gender justice. But today we are here to convene the second session of our webinar series and to listen to Dr. Vaida Nainar. So without further ado, I request Dr. Vibhuti Patel to please uh, take the event forward. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Jyoti, Jyoti Madam, and uh, good afternoon, friends. We are really impressed by the overwhelming response that we have received today. More than 600 uh, uh, participants are there on various platforms of uh, IMPRI. And uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank Madam Jyoti Rawal, Dr. Arjit Kumar, and Dr. Sini Mehta for their really hard work and providing this platform for an important debate. A feminist foreign policy is gaining a great interest and healthy curiosity, uh, not only among the movers and shakers and politicians and policymakers, but also the students and teachers and researchers and think tanks are showing great interest. Now, first of all, let us have a recap of what happened in the previous session uh, briefly that in the first session, in her mind-blowing and erudite lecture by Dr. Swarna Rajgopal, uh, that resulted in stimulating and meaningful discourse. So many questions were asked. She started with a statement that gender is a spectrum of human experience. It is not binary. Gender is determined by uh, other intersections, and we should be conscious of our privileges and reflect on our patriarchal baggage that determines how we think about the world around us. 
in the if the leaders are governed by protection of women perspective quote unquote protection of women it will affect entire spectrum of world around us as legislations and intervention strategies will not see women's agency as leaders diplomats international relation experts but only as object that needs to be protected save the women would be the main concern. She also averred that peace as a freedom from threat is linked with freedom, equality, justice, well-being, harmony, uh, and a way of life. When we talk about security, whose security? Individual security or state security of the state, uh, the uh, territories? We need to focus on physical, cultural, societal, uh, economic, ecological, and public health and emotional security. To engender peace discourse, we must unpack identity, prejudice, invisibility, inequality, discrimination, violence, and impunity. Dr. Rajgopal Swarna also said that violence is a language of inequality, and there is inextricable and inalienable relation between insecurity and violence. Insecurity is an early morning signal of violence, and she analyzed ethnic cleansing of the subjugated identity through enforced pregnancy, child marriage, proliferation of legal and illegal arms, and she also explained how all peace uh, consequences are gendered. In the, uh, she reflected on conflict and post-conflict situations in Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, why varied responses of UNHRC intervention? She tried to answer that question and culture, uh, uh, culture which are deeply patriarchal and geopolitical history play a very important role in the outcome of global solidarity efforts. And uh, in the UN also, we witnessed a strong gender bias, like uh, women got up to speak and men got up to smoke. She said humorously that this is how the, the women's uh, uh, interventions are, uh, are uh, getting male reaction. So how to make the world that is livable? To build international consensus, feminist foreign policy is important. We cannot allow the devaluing feminist values around equality and justice. They, there are no substitute for everyday engagement. That, that is what this school aims at, that we need to integrate this perspective in our everyday engagement. Power of termite, I think Dr. Uh, gave a very good metaphor, Dr. Swarna, that power of termite, though tiny and invisible, will one day break the walls of misogynist patriarchy. I think it was such a powerful statement that she made. We, uh, we persist in asking when people are not listening. That means that is what we want to uh, 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 we want to do. That you continuously never stop questioning. We must exercise our citizenship right. Minority community need not ask for inclusion and acceptance. It is the duty of the majority community. I think that was another prophetic statement Dr. Swarna gave. And feminist policy, foreign policy must be inclusive, sustainable, and strong that promotes gender equality, and it must empower the weak. And already eight countries have adopted this policy, as Dr. Simi Mehta also told us. And according to the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, and I quote, a feminist approach to foreign policy provides powerful lens through which we can interrogate the violent global systems of power that leave millions of people in perpetual states of vulnerability, quote, complete. In other words, the feminist foreign policy involves a government making domestic and global gender equality issues one of its central goals, and it is a multidimensional policy which aims to improve experiences and quality of life of women and the marginalized groups. So today we have, like, uh, it is feminist foreign policy when it recognizes gender inclusiveness as a policy priority and questions patriarchal institution, the framework. Greater representation of women in foreign policy and decision-making, development assistance for to empower women uh, and placing gender and women's vulnerability on a transnational security agenda are the topmost uh, priority. Let, us, let me remind you that currently there are 200 places in the on this planet where the territorial wars or civil wars are fought, uh, resulting in a massive human miseries marked by homelessness, sexual violence, diseases, hunger, and human trafficking. Today, we have uh, Dr. Vaida Nainar, an expert who has worked extensively as well as intensively on the politics of gender in the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security, as well as implementation of UN Security Council resolution 1325 uh, on women, peace, and security. And Dr. Vaida 
has who has i uh, for detail and also intellectual rigor rooted in a ground reality will share her thoughts on gender dimension of un security council based on her first hand experiences uh, over to dr vaita nayanak And please unmute yourself. Is my screen uh, visible? Yeah. No. No. Okay. You can try sharing again now. Is it visible now? Yeah. Your desktop is visible now. The PPT, is it open? The, the... Oh, sorry. Ah, okay. Sorry. It should be. Yeah, it is. Oh, the yeah, fine, fine, fine. Okay. All right. First one. Okay. Just a moment. Um, yeah. But, but it's, complete, it's not completely it's, visible. It's you not. Have to... uh, yeah. I, one moment. It is not. Uh, when you started, it was visible completely. But now I think it is covered by the box. Ah, okay. Fine. Fine. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vibhuti. And uh, I thank um, uh, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Arjun Isravel of IMPRI for organizing this very important uh, uh, online school program on feminist foreign policy. It's a pleasure to be here today and speak on this topic on gender dimension of UN Security Council. Um, uh, and the gender dimension of UN Security Council really uh, begins with this resolution 1325 that Professor Patel referred to. And I've had the fortunate, uh, I've been fortunate to be around uh, in UN at the time uh, when this resolution was being passed. Uh, although I was um, doing advocacy on a parallel process of International Criminal Court, our caucus, which I was heading, uh, was very much an integral part of the NGO that was advocating for the passing of the 1325 resolution. So uh, this is what uh, the UN Security Council, the gender dimension of UN Security Council really um, um, you know, um, focuses around, that is the whole women, peace and security agenda. So I will um, begin by just delineating some of the broad topics that this uh, uh, talk would cover. Uh, one would be the general brief background on conflict, peace and security and women's experiences of these security, therefore, you know, paving the way for the need for the intervention of UN Security Council. And when we talk of UN Security Council, I would also begin by giving a brief uh, background on the structure and the mandate of UN uh, Security Council, followed by the various uh, Security Council resolutions that collectively constitute what is called the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, followed by uh, how these resolutions came about in the sense of what are the advocacy uh, points of this agenda and how did these resolutions come about? Who are the stakeholders and what is the advocacy space? Uh, followed by briefly the implementation of these uh, women, peace and security agenda, the, uh, the successes and challenges of uh, the, uh, the, these resolution over the years. And finally, some of the feminist critiques of the resolutions and the debates around it to complete and round up this, this particular discussion. So let's begin with um, conflict, peace and security, these brief background and women's experiences. Um, uh, post end of the Cold War, uh, the nature of conflict shifted from being primarily between two countries to being internal conflicts within states. Civilian populations were both the target and the means of warfare in these internal conflicts. Uh, several United Nations humanitarian interventions were launched in conflict-ridden and unstable countries. By the end of 1990s, there was a change seen through the huge stream of refugees and internally displaced persons in conflicts throughout Africa and in the Balkans. These conflicts saw an exponential rise in the use of sexualized violence as a tool of war, as a means of combat, predominantly against directed against women and girls. 
Now, women are impacted by conflicts in several different ways. There is one, the personal vulnerability. Women and girls experience random and targeted sexual and gender-based violence, vulnerable to being trafficked into sexual slavery, forced labor, and forced prostitution, and other forms of violence. There is social disruption. Conflict causes destruction of familial and social lives. Overnight communities are disrupted. Men join, are recruited, or conscripted into state or rebel armed forces and uh, to be ready to engage in combats. Homes and entire villages are destroyed, leaving women landless and homeless, forcing them into relief and refugee camps that are constructed overnight in cramped spaces. Women are left to fend for themselves and the young and the old of the community, often with little knowledge or skills on how to go about doing it. Then there is economic uncertainty. Women and families are faced with hunger, food, livelihood, job and income insecurities and are dependent on aid for their subsistence. Women who have been kept away from the labor market then have no option but to enter the workforce and, and without any skills often end up in low paying jobs or otherwise exploitative labor conditions. And there is health impact of the conflicts when which sees an exponential rise in maternal and infant mortality and a big impact on access uh, to sexual and reproductive health. Then there are psychological uh, impact where which, which the experience of conflict, the impact it has on its life, the disruption of their lives overnight, the vulnerability and experience of gender and sexual uh, violence causes severe mental health problems, particularly trauma, depression, fear, impacting the quality of women's lives. Then there is sign other significant aspect is the aspect of peace and security. Women in conflict zones are forced to take an increased public and leadership role, which, which, can be, uh, uh, which, which is the unintended positive uh, change or, uh, that conflict causes to gain access, for example, to services in refugee camps, to go out and earn income for their household, to organize care for the young and elderly in the camps, to engage in cross-party peace initiatives, campaigns, protests to end conflict, organize and work towards justice and reconciliation initiatives. Uh, then you have, uh, that's, that's these, these are the impacts of conflicts that, um, that, that an international organization have, uh, like the United Nations have had to intervene. Um, traditionally, there has been little interest among the most powerful member states of the Security Council to discuss other issues other than those directly linked to their primary concern that is ongoing conflicts or immediate threat to international peace and security. The changing nature of the conflict also led to a change to some extent reluctantly in the attitudes of the members of Security Council towards thematic issues. Before we move forward, just a brief about the basic structure. Uh, the Security Council of the United Nations derives its mandate from the United Nations Charter particularly articles 23 to 32. These articles states the basics of the structure, its functions, the voting rights and participation of non-members. The Security Council is a 15 member council, five of them permanent members with veto powers and 10 members elected every two years. Uh, each member has one vote. Decisions are made by affirmative vote of nine members including concurrent vote of the permanent five. A non-party member, uh, a non-member party to the dispute under consideration by the Security Council is invited to participate without vote in the discussions related to the dispute. The primary responsibility entrusted to the Council is to maintain international peace and security. And this function, it, uh, it is, is accomplished by regularly passing resolutions to note escalating situations of conflict around the world, designated, designating conflicts as threat to international peace and security, calling for ceasefire, imposing sanctions, embargoes, uh, sending peacekeeping forces, 
establishing committees, subcommittees, tribunals, or other mechanisms to deal with the ongoing conflict crisis or post-conflict reconstruction. Generally, a distinction is made between council resolutions adopted under chapter six and resolutions un adopted under chapter seven of the UN Charter. Resolutions under chapter seven are invoked when a breach of peace is believed to have occurred or a threat to international peace and security is thought to exist. Such resolutions are coercive in nature and are regarded as binding on member states. Resolutions adopted under chapter seven, six include them thematic resolutions and, of, and are of non-coercive nature. They carry uh, what is called a normative imperative that is intended to influence, influence behaviors of, of the member state in short or long-term at both national and international level. Now, uh, it, is, it is this council through its mandate for of uh, securing international peace and uh, uh, security that passed several um, uh, council resolutions that are collectively called uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. The first historic resolution is the resolution 1325 passed in the year 2000. And it deals with protection, gender inclusion of gender perspective, representation, relief, and recovery. The 1325 being an important resolution, we, I will dwell on it with, for a bit, a bit more. The resolution urges member states to increase representation and active participation of all women at uh, decision-making levels in national, regional, and international institutions and mechanisms for conflict prevention, conflict management, conflict resolution, and peace building. A gender perspective is required to be adopted in the planning and implementation of peace operations and peace negotiations, including gender sensitive training of personnel, an expanded role for women as peacekeepers and increased attention to local women's peace initiatives, needs and interest in mission areas. The resolution emphasizes the need for increased attention to the protection and respect of women's rights, including protection against gender-based violence in situations of armed conflict and initiatives to put an end to impunity for such crimes. The next resolution was passed a year later, Resolution 1820. It further strengthened, strengthened the protection aspect of, uh, and addresses sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict situation. The 1888 resolution, um, uh, the council intended to strengthen protection uh, by establishing a position of special representative on, uh, of, on sexual violence in, in conflict. It also includes specific provision for protection of women and children from sexual violence in manual peacekeeping operations. Then you have the um, um, uh, 18 and 1889, which notes the obstacle for women's full participation. Then the in year 20, 1960 was uh, adopted, uh, which uh, requested the Secretary General to add an annex to the annual report that the uh, Secretary General produces, um, which and to list conflicting parties that are suspected of committing uh, patterns of rape and other forms of sexual violence in situations of armed conflict. So that is uh, uh, that is the one on um, uh, on um, of 2010. In 2013, a resolution 2106 emphasized the prevention of sexual violence important to international peace and security. Uh, uh, again, uh, in 2013. The, uh, the resolution invited the Secretary General to commission a global study to, for implementation of the resolution of 13, 1325. The study was commissioned, it took two years to complete, and in 2015, it passed another resolution, 2242, which uh, was about incorporating the recommendations from this global study uh, by member states. In, uh, in the resolution 2272, the council addressed sexual exploitation and abuse by its own United Nations peacekeeping forces. Among other measures in response to the problem, it endorsed uh, the previous decision by Secretary General to repatriate units in peacekeeping operation in cases 
where there is credible evidence of widespread or systematic sexual exploitation and abuse by that unit. So that was that was in, in the year 2016. After that, the last two resolutions that were passed was uh, two years uh, in 2019. Uh, which is the first one in, uh, in 2019 recognized the need for a survivor centric approach um, in conflict related sexual violence. And the last one reiterated the need for full implementation of women, peace and security agenda and expressed deep concern of the persistent barriers for the full implementation of this agenda. Uh, so these uh, resolutions, these are uh, about, you know, by uh, 11 odd resolutions uh, that collectively is the council's uh, women, peace and security agenda. Uh, and uh, the ones that lays the groundwork is a framework for all kind of actions uh, that the nation states, member states and other UN bodies and national governments are required to take to uh, uh, address the uh, issues of women, peace and security. Um, how how did these resolutions come about? You know, it's it's like um, these. It's not like the Security Council, you know, woke up one day being very concerned about women's issues and women's uh, peace and security matters, because historically there has been a strict division uh, between soft and hard issue areas within the United Nations. Women's issues have been traditionally relegated to the domains of soft policy. And thus were not something to which Security Council was required to pay attention to. There had been for a long time a formal barrier between promotion of women's rights, that is traditionally soft socio-political issues and the hard issues of international peace and security. Resolution 1325 broke this barrier. Women, peace and security has appeared as a normative issue that is increasingly difficult for member states to ignore and neglect. 1325 is a resolution that has been adopted under the chapter six of the UN Charter and is therefore a non-coercive resolution and its language is not particularly strong. It is a language that, that, is a, that, that recommends, that encourages, that you know, makes it um, you know, imperative um, for member states to, um, uh, does not quite make it imperative for member states to uh, implement it. So its uh, status as a binding uh, resolution is, is uh, not established. But perhaps that was one of the reasons for the unanimous Security Council vote in favor of this resolution. The thematic air issue area of women, peace and security by, was seen by members of the council at that time as having low priority and few, if any, saw uh, serious implications or consequence for them in practice. So member state did not quite expect that they would have to, you know, uh, implement this policy, pass, pa pass action, national action plans or uh, allocate resources or include women in representation or any such thing. Um, as a peace strategist working on conflicts, Ms. Uh, Andalini remarks, in all likelihood, council members were not fully aware of the way in which women's groups in civil society, governments, and the UN system would keep resolution 1325 alive. So this resolution has been kept alive by, by the civil society organizations around, around the world, by advocacy at the UN Security Council. What does this advocacy uh, involve? Um, the advocacy involves primarily getting these resolutions, this, this collective of 11 resolutions passed and getting the desired language in these resolutions on various aspects of women, peace and security. It includes keeping up with the implementation of these resolutions that are uh, reflected in the annual uh, presidential statement, the statement that the Secretary Council President makes annually. So the uh, advocacy continues to uh, ensure that, that the presidential statement includes concerns on implementation of the uh, uh, Secretary Council resolutions. Uh, if there is a need or there is lack of clarity in the Council resolutions, there is advocacy that is required to uh, get the elaboration and clarification included in this presidential statement. 
then there is uh, the need for uh, the statement to acknowledge and uh, uh, give responses to the Secretary General's report on women, peace and security. So all these um, language that, uh, that um, goes into the presidential statement is, is an important aspect because that is the statement that reflects the ongoing implementation of these women, peace and security uh, collective of resolution. It also involves blocking any new resolution, blocking any new resolution or move by any member of the Secretary Council to dilute or weaken the language on existing uh, women, peace and security resolution. Um, uh, apparently there has been such one such experience uh, because uh, when in 2021 uh, last year, Russia was the president of the Security Council introduced a resolution on women, peace and security with language that was regressive. Um, the, uh, and they can do that because presidency of the council uh, have the power to introduce any regulation, whether or not it is required. The resolution was not passed, but there is always the concern that um, delegates, uh, the presidency of uh, the council could uh, potentially introduce uh, resolutions that are that undo uh, and unravel the work done by the existing um, council resolution. The main space for advocacy uh, on, on these resolution is the annual open debate that is held in October on the anniversary of the 1325 resolution. These open debates are organized by member states and they often introduce new topic for debate and discussion. The agenda of the open debates are informed by Secretary General's annual report on women, peace and security and other matters that nation state hosting the open debate may prioritize. This is the forum, that is the open debate is a forum where the council hears statements from briefers, security council members and other states. And all the resolutions that are passed so far that we just discussed, the 11 resolutions, are often the outcome document uh, and the results of the annual open debate. The briefers usually include the UN uh, Secretary General, the Executive Director of UN Women, representative of other UN agency, and one civil society representative selected by the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. So unlike other advocacy spaces or the space that I was uh, a part of at the International Criminal Court, where civil society had more access for uh, uh, you know, advocate with the member states, here there is, uh, there is just one civil society representative selected to uh, brief the council. Uh, on, on one issue. Of course, if there are several issues that are being discussed, then, then there are several civil society representatives that, uh, uh, that serve as the briefer to the council. Um, the other major advocacy space is, uh, is a, a, an informal group that is initiated and hosted by Canada uh, with over 90 member states on the issue of women's peace and security. I understand the informal group is called Friends of 1325 or Friends of Women, Peace and Security. In this informal group meeting, uh, civil society representatives are pre periodically invited to speak on issues of concern uh, or, or, or the issues that they want raised and discussed. The NGO working group informs this process, helps with agenda setting, provides clear cut guidance and discussion, and the decisions from this group are then taken forward to the council. Uh, member states also approach the civil society organization to get ideas and inputs to their, into their own national statements. And these, this feedback from the informal group also feeds into the member states position on various issues of women, peace and security. The other advocacy, uh, not the physical space, but our opportunity are the two um, reports on women, peace and security issued by the Secretary General of the United Nations. One is the annual report, uh, Secretary General's annual report on women, peace and security, which is released in October, a week or two ahead of the open debate. And the other is the uh, Secretary General's report on conflict related sexual violence. The, the draft of the above two reports are prepared by the UN women with information they have from field offices, from civil society organizations in conflict countries, with new information on the status of implementation of the women 
peace and security resolution or on sexual violence in conflict. The, uh, the Security General also seeks contribution to this report from member states and the civil society organization in conflict countries have the opportunity to send their shadow reports on the status of implementation of women, peace and security uh, for inclusion in this draft. So the, it's the UN Women that finalizes the draft and sends it out to CS civil society organization for inputs and comments. And this is another opportunity for civil society organization to influence their report, uh, influence the report, add their objections, suggestions, and recommendations and improvement to the draft. Beyond this, the civil society have no ability to further influence the report in the event that suggestions and recommendations are not included in the final, final report. Then you have uh, the aspect of female civil society representative at the council, which is to say actually as briefers in the open debate. Resolution 2242 uh, expressed the council's intention to invite civil society, including women's organization to brief the council in country specific consideration and relevant thematic areas. Since this resolution was adopted in 2015, the council has made considerable strides in, in a more equal representation of civil society. The number of civil society female briefers have steadily increased. In 2017, 10 out of the 14 civil society briefers were female. In 2018, uh, 24 out of 30 were female. And in 2019, the number has again risen and 42 uh, uh, female society uh, briefers briefed the council of the 53 uh, briefers in total. Now these briefers, uh, you know, risk their lives to uh, come and brief the members of the security council. So addressing the council can have repercussion for briefers. For example, in 2019, in a 2019 letter to the president of the security council, the permanent mission of Libya strongly criticized the briefing given by Inas Milud, co-founder and director of the Tamazayat women's movement in Libya during the annual open debate on co co conflict-related sexual violence to the council. In response, um, uh, the ambassadors of seven council members had to sign a letter to the president to say that Notwithstanding the disagreement of the government of Libya with the content of Ms. Milib's briefing, they, they urged uh, the government of Libya to uh, that she and, and express trust that she will be allowed to continue her work unhindered. Um, again, in his 2019 uh, annual report on women, peace and security, the Secretary General signaled his extreme concerns over such reports when he referred to the case of Radia of the Yemeni Mawatma Organization for Human Rights, who briefed the Security Council in 2017. She was reportedly arbitrarily detained and her passport confiscated, seemingly for her engagement with the UN Security Council when attempting to fly out of Yemen. So, um, uh, you know, being in this space, uh, doing advocacy at the UN Security Council on issues of peace, women, peace and security uh, is a high risk of, for women human rights defenders or any other defenders working in conflict countries. Um, and there are, uh, the, in, then there are, um, uh, we move on to the implementation of women, peace and security uh, resolutions and try and uh, note the successes and challenges of these uh, collective set of resolution. Uh, there have been a number of successes in implementation of the uh, women, peace, security resolution over the years. The international community has adopted a comprehensive normative framework on sexual violence in conflict. Um, uh, with regard to sexual violence in conflict. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that came into force in 2002 outlines a comprehensive list of crimes against women. Since the 1990s, international courts and tribunals have developed sophisticated jurisprudence with regard to these crimes. Then the Security Council has uh, called for appointment of a special representative on sexual violence in, con in conflict. Uh, uh, to report to the Council on the implementation of uh, the Women, Peace and Security. Uh, commissions of inquiries and fact-finding missions are set up by the Human Rights Council 
And these co co commissions increasingly have a mandate to investigate sexual and gender-based violence. And there is a roster of experts that exist within the international community to support the investigation of these international crimes. The international community and national governments have begun to understand increasingly the importance of national and communi community healing as a part of holistic justice and accountability processes, including truth and reconciliation commission, truth seeking exercise, memorial memorializations and reparations for women victims of violations. The other kind of success would be the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women adopted the general recommendation number 30 on women in conflict prevention, conflict and post-conflict situations, which provide detailed guidance to member states on issues related to women, peace and security and the criteria for accountability and makes clear that implementing resolution 1325 is the responsibility of every member state. Between um, 1990 and 2000, uh, when the Security Council adopted 1325, only 11% of peace agreements signed include a reference to women. After the adoption of 1325, 27% of peace agreements have referenced women. Of the six agreements resulting from the peace talks or national dialogue processes supported by the UN in 2014, 67% contained references relevant to women, peace, and security. And there has been a rise in women in leadership position in the, in the UN, uh, from special envoys of the Secretary General to the first female commander of the peacekeeping mission. Um, similarly, bilateral aid on gender equality to fragile state has quadrupled in the last decade, uh, but from a practically non-existent level at the start. So when, when, or from when they started, there was no such um, aid to the fragile state in the last decade, it, one has seen uh, that it has increased consistently. Um, at the same time, as the, as the successes are noted, obstacle and challenges still persist and prevent full implementation of the women, peace and security agenda. Among, among these challenges are, uh, are around the National Action Plan for Implementation of Security Council 1325. These national action plans are national level strategy documents that outline a government's approach and course of action for localizing action on women, peace and security agenda. These documents outline objectives and activities that countries take both on the domestic and international level to secure the human rights of women and girls in conflict settings, prevent armed conflict and violence, including against women and girls, and ensure the meaningful participation of women in peace and security. But uh, the facts are on, on this action plan remains that only 53% of member states have adopted national action plans. Of these, uh, uh, these only 36% of these plans include a budget for implementation. Only 32% include references to and, and specific actions towards, for example, dis disarmament. Uh, but a 72%, uh, a relatively high percent, include a role for civil society organization in, in implementation. Uh, despite the comprehensive normative framework uh, introduced with regard to se uh, sexual violence, there are very few actual prosecutions, particularly at the national level. Though some argue that the normative frameworks have deterred future crimes, others claim there has been no significant difference for women on the ground. There isn't much research uh, available to either validate or refute these claims uh, on, on, the, uh, on the impact uh, of this framework in actual prosecution. The participation of women in formal peace processes have been steadily inching up but a study of 31 major peace processes between 1992 and 2001 revealed that only 9% of negotiators were women and only 3% of the military in UN missions are women. And the majority of these women uh, are employed as support staff. So these two areas of peacemaking through uh, participation of women as negotiators and peacekeeping through women in UN peacekeeping missions are among the most persistently challenging 
for ensuring women's equal and meaningful participation. Then the rise of violent extremism in many parts of the world has led to a real threat to the women, peace and security agenda and to the lives of women, as well as to the rise in the cycle of militarization. Where, uh, where in situations where women are often in an ambivalent position, rejecting the strictures on their conduct by violent extremists, but at the same time wanting to protect their families and communities from polarization and threat. Some women also become fighters and join extremist groups, sometimes against their will, but many out of real conviction. And though there is a great deal of rhetoric supporting uh, women, peace and security funding for programs and processes, uh, funding for programs and processes remains abysmally low across all agenda areas of the women, peace and security agenda. Bilateral aid has increased to fragile states with regard to gender issues, but it is still only 6% of the total aid package and only 2% of the aid is earmarked for peace and security. So we will now move on to the feminist critiques of, on the women, peace and security agenda. And these critiques are also uh, very well, uh, you know, discussed in the reading material that was sent to the participants of this session. Uh, to reading material and, and this critique session of this um, aspect of this particular session is also uh, referenced through to those articles. Uh, broadly, it must be re recalled and remembered that the Council's Women, Peace and Security resolutions are the outcome of political negotiations in a setting characterized by power relations. Secretary Council members are not all equal. There is tremendous power relations within the Council. The permanent five are more, are more powerful than the other 10 members, uh, elected members. And even within the 10 elected members, there are power differential with some being in a more power position than, than others. And it is these power relations in, in, in these contexts of power relation in which this a very specific understanding of gender and security that, has, that is being uh, generated. Among the critiques, the first is that the resolutions, the Women, Peace and Resolutions does not address the structural roots of gender inequalities, including entrenched understanding of patriarchy, masculinity and militarized power. Further, the basic causes of conflict are not addressed in these resolutions. The concept of peace building in the United Nations is too narrow and maintains that, that peace must, must be linked to security and justice and freedom from uh, poverty, exclusion and oppression. Whereas the description uh, uh, in uh, resolution 1325 or is focused on women's vulnerability and it serves to justify the placement of gender and, and, and it is, it is it's, uh, it's categorized as, as such to serve, to justify the placement of gender on the security agenda and legitimize the introduction of very specific measures. In, in the feminist traditions, women's vulnerability is considered to result from gender power, gender power relations being acting out in society. Therefore, women's vulnerability does not uh, begin or arise from war or a specific feature for, of the war, but it's rather continuous and persistent. Violence in war zones and peace zones are connected in terms of the existence of a parallel form of war against women occurring at all times, regardless of whether the context is defined as war as one or one of peace. Uh, by contrast, uh, in the Women, Peace and Security Resolution, the problem is defined as one of conflict situations in which women find themselves and the sexual difference is constructed as something that women simply embody. So in such context, women uh, are thus left with one option that is to be, become victims in such context who is required to be protected by someone else. And this, in this whole focus on women's vulnerability 
in the Women, Peace and Security Resolution, uh, the, it essentializes women. These resolution essentializes women, which is that it is built on an essentialist idea that women are more peaceful than men, that they have much needed competence to be in peacekeeping missions because mediators and ceasefire monitors with knowledge of sexual violence are sorely lacking or that women feel most secure in reporting violence to other women. Thus, the presence of women in peacekeeping missions may encourage women from local communities to report acts of sexual violence. So the, so, so the need, the, the, the 325, which prioritizes or emphasizes on women's participation and representation, the reason for such participation or representation is to ensure that women uh, are involved in peacekeeping missions so that other women can, can uh, report acts of sexual violence or they can uh, you know, um, be in the peacekeeping mission because they are um, because there are there is a lack of uh, knowledge of, of personnel with uh, on sexual violence. So when um, so that being the case, the answer to the complicated question of what women represents in this aspect of representation of 1325 is simply women. That is, women represent other women. Even when women participate in local armed forces and necessarily participate in war, <clears throat> their function is still to represent women, i.e. the presence of women peacekeepers may encourage local women to participate in national armed and security forces. So the, they, they are always addressing other women in these processes. And the representation is <clears throat> designed to, uh, to, uh, to you know, speak on behalf of other women uh, who are the victims. So women per security resolution responses to women's vulnerability are therefore too. So if you are focusing uh, on women's vulnerability in, in these resolutions, then how does these resolutions respond to that? That is by in, in twofold. One is by encouraging and ensuring the participation and representation of women. And one uh, and, and these resolution does that by, it, by regarding women as a homogenous group and, and can therefore represent other women. Because they are a homogenous group, they are better placed to represent other women. Fundamental to the idea of women as representative of other women is the proposition that women share common traits and interests and constitute a homogenous group with clear separation with, uh, within this homogenous group. That is the women who are representatives are separated from women who are represented. Representatives are ascribed agency, whereas those uh, represented are lacking in it and therefore victims. Now, and to be granted uh, the position as representatives in the women, peace and security agenda, uh, they must be empowered and appointed by the men in the state where they are citizens or by the United Nations. Thus women who are protected by men are encouraged to protect other women. In this chain of protection, as it is called by the authors of the articles, women participate as protectors while they are simultaneously protected themselves. The implication of the women peace resolutions are that when women protect other women, the relationship is considered to be devoid of gender power. Even if the relationship is hierarchical, which it is, so if there are women in peacekeeping missions, um, the relation within the peacekeeping mission of women is hierarchical because some women are commander and more positions of power than other foot soldiers within the peacekeeping mission or between the peacekeeping mission and the women they try to protect, that is the victims in the conflict areas. So there exists hierarchical, but it is assumed that no dominance arise, arises because both parties are of the same sex. And when you assume that, you're neglecting the differences among women and treat relations among women as non-hierarchical. So the problem of male-female relations as a potentially power-laden power relations is solved by these resolution by removing men from the equation, replacing men uh, peacekeepers with women peacekeepers to address other women in the scene of the conflict or the war. This solution is motivated by the idea of ensuring the comfort and respecting the preferences of protected women, 
but it also at the same time equally serves to protect the male peacekeepers or the other uh, male uh, participants, stakeholders in the entire process of uh, peacekeeping from being accused of reproducing gender inequalities. And the second way in which these resolutions address um, the focus on women's vulnerability uh, is by criminal, criminalization of rape and sexual violence. Rape requires legal measures that impose personal responsibility because rape and sexual violence necessarily imply the existence of a perpetrator who is often a man. The construction of rape and sexual violence as crime thus potentially allows for a discussion, you know, it has a potentially to allow for a discussion on how gender relations, violence and power are connected and linked with each other. But that is not how it is actually discussed in the Women, Peace and Security Resolution. The logic for discussing sexual violence in the council resolution is restricted to the argument that such violence must be uh, abolished because it threatens peace and security or stability. So violence against women impedes peace because it negatively affects women's role as agents of peace. If women are important actors of reconciliation in post-war con conflict situation, protecting them from horrors of war is a way to protecting a resource, a necessary resource for peace building. Then the other is a rape, similarly rape as sexual violence uh, and sexual violence as part of a violence continuing continuum between peacetime and conflict times. Yeah. Feminist security studies assert that rape and sexual violence constitute acute threat to women on a daily basis, regardless of whether the context is defined as peace or war. The Women Peace Resolutions argue that it is the context that defines rape and sexual violence as acute. Therefore, sexual violence and rape in this specific sense are considered different from both peacetime sexual violence or the ordinary violence of war. So the wartime rape and uh, having made this distinction, wartime rape and sexual violence are regarded as a specific and illegitimate form of violence that must be abolished, whereas peace similar violence in peace times are defined or regarded as legitimate that can persist and requires no specific mention on, by the council or measures to combat. So that is, uh, you know, broadly the broad areas of feminist critique on, on the women, peace and security resolution. In conclusion, one can say that these critiques are a valid and necessary part of understanding the limitations of women, peace and security resolutions. Inclusion of these critiques enable a moving goalpost that can be pursued and achieved incrementally. In 1990s, it was unthinkable that women, peace and security agenda would ever become part of the Security Council. 1325 broke that barrier. And since then, and there have been um, incremental advances in the Women, Peace, Security agenda with subsequent resolutions, enhancing protection, ensuring participation, enabling representation, and making provisions for relief and reconciliation. Similar uh, incremental advances could be aimed at by civil society and women's organizations to address the root causes of conflict, the structural and geopolitical issues that sustains conflict, acknowledge conflict-related violence as continuing from non-related, non-conflict-related violence uh, to conflict-related violence and continuing in post-conflict situations and treat it as such, uh, that is, as a continuum. In short, the valid critics, the, 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 these valid critics, uh, points of critics does not uh, negate the existence or the need for a women, peace and security agenda, because the fact remains that conflicts are raging around and across the world as we speak. And there is a need for protection and there is a need for relief and reconciliation and there is a need for peace uh, keeping and peacemaking and women's involvement in peacekeeping processes. Um, and and uh, so there, there is all, all of this need. So it's not to negate the existence of women, peace and security agenda, but to acknowledge that it remains an incomplete agenda and one that requires additional simultaneous 
and creative advocacy to address the shortcomings and the gaps. And, and with that, I will um, uh, pass on the um, session back to the chair. It's um, been a pleasure. I look forward to the um, questions and conversation post this session. Um, I, I do not promise that I would be able to respond to all the questions, but uh, the, but it's nevertheless important to raise the questions and make uh, observations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaidya Naina, for making such an erudite and mind-blowing presentation. First of all, what uh, some of the highlights of your uh, lecture, mainly about the strict division between soft and hard issues. And I think that uh, has been the UN legacy even right from 1975 that women's movement is fi uh, fighting against. The And other thing, well, most important action agenda you gave was the main space for advocacy, that where are the democratic spaces for the civil society organization, human rights defenders, and uh, women's movement. So that is very uh, important. Uh, a light that you have thrown, and I think that will also galvanize us into action and give up our you know, inertia. Uh, uh, other very important concern that you have raised is that uh, of all the series of uh, uh, articles and the uh, resolutions with the UN Security Council has passed over uh, 2000 onwards, and some of the nations are making a very good use of it. For example, Nepal, 13, 1325, yes. they have used it so mm -hmm. effectively, and even at uh, even the common citizens also know about its implications. Uh, and uh, your very important concern about the security and the of the and social protection for the human rights defenders. And I think currently in several countries they are facing yes. problem. I think I also uh, liked your statement about the Russia trying to dilute the content of your 1325 and how the uh, advocacy efforts they prevented it from having uh, 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 prevented it from getting it diluted. Uh, what you said is that women who are protected by men, they are asked to protect other women. I think that is true even in the domestic policy, that those who are working within the uh, within the framework of either benevolent patriarchy, they are the ones uh, who are, who, who, who get the advantages and the privileges of patriarchy. They are the ones who become the champions for women's rights. I think that we have seen right from the uh, social reform movement, the 19th century social reform movement till now. But I think that there is a time that now we also adopt intersectional approach, intersectional perspective in the implementation of, of all these resolutions. And I think that's what is emerging from your presentation. Now the floor is open for debate, discussion, questioning, questions and whatever experiences because there are participants from several countries, they sure. can also share their experiences. Those who want to speak can either raise their hand or unmute and speak. In the chat box or, or in the question box, I don't see any. Who would like to go first? Hello. The floor is open. Yes, Alia Khan, Dr. Alia Khan, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vanida, for a very, very um, intensive uh, dive into how the UN uh, Security Council resolution uh, looks at the whole issue of uh, WPS. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the role of the feminist uh, movement uh, or the women's movement in shaping uh, such resolutions with your uh, knowledge of how these resolutions are drafted. Could you throw some light on that? Because uh, for example, in uh, Pakistan, um, there is a movement called the Aurat uh, March and the Women's Democratic Movement, which is mainly younger uh, women mobilizing uh, for rights, but uh, they don't seem to really connect with this whole issue of women, peace and uh, security. So if you could uh, expand on that a little bit, thank you very much. 
Sure, thank you, Alia, for your question. Um, the, the entire resolutions and particularly the 1325 resolution have been shaped by uh, women's movement, the international women's movement. And uh, this has come about uh, because of interventions from women in conflict countries. So uh, all the women's rights organizations or other organizations that work in conflict countries um, have together put come together to put these drafts from their experiences. Mm -hmm. So there is these women's groups, women's organization in conflict countries have several experiences and, and some of it that I started with. And, and it comes out from what are the measures required to, uh, to alleviate these uh, experiences? How, what, what is required? So it comes from women who then, um, you know, come up to, to put together a policy on what are the measures that they would require to, uh, to address some of their experiences in conflict countries. And when these experiences then come to the um, you know, regional and national level, these are put together in terms of putting the draft, drafting languages of such resolution is a very, um, a very painstaking ex exercise. And um, in the sense that every, uh, every word is debated, um, uh, debated thoroughly, every word is uh, you know, discussed and um, and 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 uh, within the women within the women's movement, they know what measures they want, and they come up with the policy. And when that draft is taken to uh, to the uh, powers that be that is going to pass those resolution, the language sometimes completely changes, and it changes because uh, because then. Uh, what happens is the, the the power relations that I talked about between member states and their interests, specific interests, then come into play in terms of whether they support that language or no. So if it says that um, you know uh, women are sub required to uh, the thirteen twenty five resolution, for example, says that um, that member state states should uh, ensure representation of women in peace processes. Now, what this means is that there is, there is a need for resources to be allocated to ensure that women and women's constituency are part of all the peace negotiations that happen in that particular conflict. Okay. So, uh, so the, 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 there is reluctance amongst the nation state to, uh, uh, to put in that resources. Despite 1325 um, you know, resolution and the acceptance of some of the conflict countries uh, of these provision, one sees that there is, there is rarely, there are peace negotiations happening. There are you know, all kinds of state representatives present but there are rarely women who, who are sitting around the table. And, and, the, and often the excuse is that these are conflict countries, there are resource constraints within the countries and they cannot themselves you know, allocate those resources for, to ensure women's participation. And as we know, without, as we know there are statistics that shows that peace negotiated with the presence of women actively involved in the peace negotiations have a tendency to last at least like 15 years longer. So, um, so this is, these are how, uh, you know, the actual um, uh, advocacy and um, um, uh, getting these resolution passed in the language to get resolutions passed happens. In terms of the processes, I think I mentioned in my talk as to what the process looks like. From a civil society perspective, it is the NGO working group on women, peace and security which is a coalition of various national organizations around the world that is most active on the issue of women, peace and security and the International League for Women's Peace and Freedom. They are both based in New York, but they are large co international coalitions that uh, are uh, you know, representing uh, women from conflict uh, regions. And, uh, and the space for actual, uh, advocacy with the UN Council is really outside the Council in the open debate and in the uh, in the uh, what is called the Canada's informal group that happen. It is these spaces that women uh, you know um, are able to access and influence and uh, 
keep it directly in touch with what is called the Friends of 1325, which may be a group of uh, 15 to 20 countries. And, and the normal ones are Canada, New Zealand, uh, you know, France, uh, UK, perhaps UK and US are, are not um, necessarily always supportive of the language on women, peace and security. For example, the United States always raises objection on any uh, measures, policy measures relating to women's sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. They will always have problems with that and they would uh, you know, uh, try to dilute the language and so on. Um, and uh, so there are some countries and, and that's the space for it. Um, they, uh, in terms of women not connecting with the issues of women, peace and security, I think, uh, you know, it, it, I would imagine it would be for dependent on people like you who are now participating in this process and, and realizes it's important to then take mm -hmm. it back to the organizations and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, coalitions you are a part of and talk about it and see how that can, you know, um, yes. be useful in your own spaces. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Well, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Arya. Now, there is Minita Adhikari. She has asked a question. Can you unmute yourself? Your question is there in the question box. Can you please throw some light on implementation of WPS on, on Nepal, its implementation status and effectiveness? Vinita, are you there? Huh. Yes, Vinita, please unmute yourself. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, my question was about the uh, implementation of WPS agenda on the Nepal. Like how, how do you, like where do you see the implementation of our WPS in Nepal? Like is it effective? And what are the challenges do you so see on the implementation? Thank Can you, you introduce yourself, Benita? Uh, I'm Vinita Adhikari. I'm from Nepal and currently I'm doing my international relation master's in international relations from South Asian University. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. Um, well, as, as uh, Vibhuti Patel already mentioned, uh, 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 Nepal has very successfully used the resolution 1325. There are several NGOs and women's organizations that actively use 1325 and have, uh, you know, advocated with your own governments about its implementation. Uh, Nepal has a very active national um, action plan uh, and has uh, and, and has allocated resources for its implementation as well. And uh, there are several measures also taken in uh, normative frameworks that have been introduced. In, uh, in in Nepal. I cannot uh, really, I do not, I cannot say that I'm uh, completely up, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the, um, uh, exactly the ways in which the uh, Nepal has implemented 1325, but there are several uh, Nepali organizations, you know, Nepal's human rights organization and uh, women's, women's rights organizations. Um, the names are at this point ev evade me, Renu Adhikari, uh, of uh, of Nepal and uh, there is a um, um, uh, what is our uh, yeah Rita Thapa of uh, uh, of uh, the foundation and Nepali Citizens Forum they are very active in implementation of 1325. I think if you look them up on the website and and check Nepal 1335 you will get a lot of resources on on its implementation. That's also think. they have a network of South countries. Yes, so, uh, South Asian Women's Network. Correct. That yeah. is also there. that is also there. So. There are, there's a lot of information about Nepal's implementation of 1325 available on the web that you can access. Yeah. Thank Last you. 22 years. Yeah. My question to you is about that. What has been your first hand experience of being in international criminal court? Are enough women, uh, is there adequate representation in the <coughs> jury? And experiences of Somalia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Kampuchea. Uh, in what way you saw the differences, how the gender norms in those specific countries, they implicated, they, they impacted the outcome of the efforts. <coughs> Please unmute yourself. 
so my experience of advocacy has been with the International Criminal Court process. I was the executive director of Women's Caucus for Gender Justice when the Rome Statute uh, was uh, adopted, and I was present at the Rome Statute in 1998 when the statute was adopted. And uh, the Women's Caucus was a caucus of about 25 to 30 women that came together and uh, to discuss the language and the inclusion of gender crimes in the Rome Statute of the Criminal Court. So um, when we were doing the, uh, the advocacy there, it was simultaneously the two tribunals were functioning. That is if we're in criminal tribunals of for, former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda. So the experiences of women uh, prosecuting crimes against women in these tribunals directly, uh, you know, um, uh, directly um, impacted were used in our advocacy uh, of inclusion of gender crimes in uh, the International Criminal Court. Um, and and we, we used to regularly invite, um, invite for example, survivors of uh, the Rwandan genocide uh, to our panels at the UN in, uh, in, in New York to address the member states, because there were several resistance from the member states of inclusions of certain specific crimes. For example, um, forced pregnancy, one can clearly, I can, I clearly remember, uh, received a lot of, uh, a lot of resistance, again, from the United States because of their internal politics on, uh, you know, abortion and, uh, uh, yeah, abortion rights and pro-life and anti-life, uh, you know, debates that uh, um, goes on in the U.S., and, uh, uh, and we had to bring, for example, you know, survivors from the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia, where this was a particular issue, where, uh, where there was the crime of forced and forced pregnancy with the intention of changing the, uh, you know, changing the population of the country, changing the identity of the population of the country. So that was a very real problem. And, uh, and, and that is very real when one considers any kind of genocidal, um, genocidal conflict where a certain community is targeted. One of the means of achieving that genocidal intent uh, is to uh, you know, change the, con uh, the composition of the population, is to impregnate the women of the community that you are targeting. So, um, so that was the reason for inclusion of the crime of forced pregnancy in the in the, you know, in our position papers, the Women's Caucus position papers, and when we would go and talk to members, uh, member state about the inclusion, there would always be resistance because clearly, as I mentioned, the power relations within the member state, United States have greater power with other member states. And at, at this point, I would like to, uh, I would like to also mention that these um, resolution and language and inclusion in international document does not come out, come about out of any kind of real concern for women's issues and others. All kinds of negotiation basically at the United Nations is trade off between two, two, two countries. I'm not saying that there are no member states that are, uh, you know, really care or concern about women's issues. There's most certainly are. And there are members within these uh, delegations of these states that are feminists the, who have been part of the Women's Caucus. There have been several, uh, several women who have been part, who came to the process of the advocacy of the International Criminal Court as being part of the Women's Caucus delegation, who then went on being picked up by the officials uh, member state to become part of their delegation. So in, in a way, we had our person in the official delegation. And, and these are the women who then push the, uh, push the agenda that, that we want pushed. And that's how these things happen. But coming back to the story of forced pregnancy. So when, um, uh, when uh, United States have problems with any kind of uh, you know, inclusion of particular crime in, in a document, they have the power to influence abstentions of other member states. Because what? Because those member states are dependent on on the United States for aid, for trade, for other kinds of issues, which then they are saying that you know we do not want you to support this thing because you know otherwise we withhold the aid and trade and so on. So 
at the ground level, at the, you know, when you boil it all down, it comes to these kinds of, um, um, uh, you know, trade-offs that are made that actually either gets you a language or dilutes a language or, you know, uh, you know uh, changes it completely or doesn't get passed at all. So, uh, so then eventually the forced pregnancy was included, but it was um, included with a particular, um, how do you call it, footnote or an explanation of what it means, that it does not impact, uh, it, it does not, uh, you know, mean to impact any kind of abortion, pol national abortion policies of any member states. So that then becomes the compromise that you do to get the kind of language you require in the, in the document. So in drafting laws, then when you sit with uh, these things on drafting of these, uh, it, when you have to, you know, th that's how the language proceeds. So you come up with the position papers, you want these crimes included, you go up and distribute your position papers with those delegates, they come back with their concerns, you try to address them and either dilute or then push, you know, stand your ground and push with the help of member states that are supportive of you. So that's how the advocacy happens at the United, at the Rome conference or the subsequent uh, two, two years conferences that was there to, to finalize the rules of procedure and evidence and, and elements document. But comparing it with, um, uh, with, for example, your, your question on, on Rwanda or Kampuchea or other uh, conflict situations. Bosnia, so the, Bosnia, Bosnia and uh, this thing, Somalia. Somalia. The, the, what the International Criminal Court process did was learned from those experiences and try to overcome the uh, shortcomings of those experiences and try to, you know, incorporate those within the International Criminal Court rules of procedure and evidence for sexual crimes and how do you uh, do you make sure that the uh, that the problems faced by these tribunals or the tri Cambodia tribunal does not come up in the International Criminal Court? How do you address those in the documents itself? So those were the advocacy points that we were uh, looking at in 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 the when we were doing the expert, and, and we were supported very much by, for example, the judges of Rwanda tribunal. We, uh, several times we brought Justice Navanath and Pillay to our panels in New York to address the member states when we faced resistance uh, from member states about inclusion of certain, uh, either the definition of a crime or the rules of privilege. So we had that kind of support as well uh, uh, in, in, in you know, getting the required language in, in, the, in the document. So this is how the advocacy proceeds. And, and, and one point before I conclude is, at least two members of Women's Caucus, who, as I said, were, began, came in to enter this process as our part of our delegation, went on to become part of the official country's delegation, then went on to be elected as judges in the, when the court was established in 2002. Right. And yeah, so, so we, we made sure that even uh, in the election of judges, the Women's Caucus advocated for not only women judges, but judges that had, um, that had a history or record of progressive and pro-women, uh, you know, understanding of uh, prosecution or judging women's crimes. So, yes. There are three was... more questions, two in the question box. First one is by Swarna. I wish to know that, Swarna, you can unmute and speak and how the role of UN members is decided. As you said, that there is veto power to five permanent members and others, again, have their own importance accordingly. Hello. Can you explain this question? Because first part I understood that we took power with five countries and then, uh, and the others again have their importance accordingly. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening to all. Um, thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. My Please question to yourself. you. Please introduce uh, Yes, I am Dr. Subarna Jadhav. I, I am Associate Professor from uh, BK Birla College, uh, Kalyan, which is in India. And uh, I wanted to know, ma'am, when you uh, you were uh, when you were talking about the various resolutions which are uh, which are passed in the UN, and you said that the veto power, the countries. Uh, who have the veto power, uh, they definitely have a strong hand uh, while taking up the decisions, the various decisions. And at the same time, you said that there are some other countries 
who have upper hand than the other countries. So which are the countries uh, they have the upper hand and which are the countries those who do not have uh, such a kind of uh, decision making power. So I want I wish you to highlight on this thing. Thank you so much. Okay, we have Pratibha Janji raising hand. Pratibha Janji, you can unmute. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, like for this wonderful session to ma'am. Uh, my question uh, is perhaps outside of, first of all, I, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Pratibha Jain and I am from India. Basically, I am working uh, with Kurtz International, that is non-profit organization. Yeah. So my question perhaps outside of high level advocacy and consulting, I can only speak about the uh, ground reality of India. Like uh, women are the enemies of women within the family. And as you mentioned, we need to put in place a chain to protect women from crime. But in this scenario, how can we work with women to protect themselves only? Yeah, thank you. This question from my side. I've also asked this about the caste question, no? No, there is someone else, okay, okay. yeah. Okay. Dr. Dipali Bhavate ji. Yeah, Dipali Bhavate, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Dipali, are you there? Hello, your question is that kindly throw light on Indian government's approach to implementation of UN articles and making Indian women uh, representatives of peace. Also, I would like to know about the India, Indian deprived caste women and are they represented or are they considered? So again, the question of intersectionality. And there is a question by Jagriti Shankar. Madam uh, Jagriti yeah. Shankar, would you like to unmute and explain your question? Yes, you sure. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel and uh, Dr. Vaida. Uh, very, very comprehensive presentation. We have been like, we have learned a lot in this one hour. So my question to you is uh, related to this recent uh, Russia-Ukraine war. So Russia is a permanent member of UN Security Council. So I would like to know, like, are there any uh, specific guidelines that, let's say, uh, if the permanent uh, member uh, it goes into war, you know, with other countries, then how are the women peace and security guidelines binding on that uh, country, like, like Russia, the permanent member? So uh, are there any uh, like uh, thing that uh, the Security Council can take some stringent punitive action against the permanent member? Because they are supposedly having the, you know, uh, more responsibility. Uh, so that way. Sorry, should I begin responding? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you for all the questions. Um, I, I have made a note, but uh, Vibhuti, please help me if I miss out on any. And um, I understand the first was about the power relation in Security Council and uh, who are powerful and who are not. Well, clearly the permanent five who have veto powers are, are most powerful in the Security Council. And of the balance 10 members, uh, these 10 members are elected members for every two years. So every two years, the composition of the Security Council changes. And in those 10, uh, among those 10 members, some members are more powerful than the other in, in all, uh, in all uh, at all times. So one cannot say that one is more powerful than the other, but um, uh, typically the ones, the, you know, um, the ones that are in, uh, from the you know, third world countries, small countries have less power. Um, existing 10 member, if I recall correct, are Albania, Andorra, Brazil, India. Uh, these days are part of, uh, for example, the Security Council. Um, in, in the 10 uh, existing Security Council, I would say, for example, India and Brazil are more powerful than Albania and Andorra. Huh? But having said that, one has to remember that each member in the Security Council has one vote. So the vote of even Albania is important. So when I, when I speak about trade-offs, eventually everything is trade-off. Albania, if any member want, 
to get that nine affirmative vote to get anything passed, a resolution passed. Even Albania holds a lot of power to trade its vote for something that uh, you know another member state, powerful member state, can provide it. So, so even there, the power relations work. Yes, technically, the more powerful nations have power, but because of the fact that a country like Andorra or uh, Albania has one vote, they still have power that they can trade their vote for something that their country needs. And that's how eventually the negotiation, and, and to that extent, um, at that particular point, they, they do have power, okay? So these, these power relations, while some members are more powerful at all times, they, 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 they do, other members do have powers at different points in time and uh, for different uh, matters under discussion and so on. So it is not uniform at all uh, times and for all uh, levels and for all matters under discussion that one can say that these countries are always powerful and these countries are, are not. So that is one thing. In terms of how the voting happens, uh, each decision to pass require, as I said, nine uh, votes, including the concurring votes of the permanent members. But if um, the permanent member um, uh, is not in agreement with a particular vote, they can, uh, the, a particular matter under discussion, they can veto it. And if they say no, then the resolution does not pass. But in terms of practice, what happens is that the other members are able to uh, impress upon this member state to abstain from voting. And so if the permanent member abstain from voting and they and the rest of the, and they still have nine votes the resolution passes and that's how most of the resolution passes i think the last couple of resolutions on uh, third, uh, on women peace and security had objections from russia and china but uh, they abstained and did not exercise their veto power and as a result of which those uh, those resolutions were passed and these abstentions are again, you know, the other nine members or the other members of the resolution council, resolution, uh, sorry, security council do what is called back channel negotiations and other kind of trade offs with these two countries who then agree to take care, we will abstain and, you know, and then they allow so called the resolution to pass and they remain, um, you know, abstain. So that's how it works at the UN Security Council. Uh, the other, uh, what I uh, see right now is how the Indian government approached the implementation of international um, obligations. Um, well, uh, I, the Indian government does not have a very good record of implementation of international, its international obligations and the standards that is set at the United Nations. On some matters it does, on others it doesn't. Um, so for example, uh, with regard to, um, what can I say, the immediate thing that comes to my mind, uh, India has ratified, signed and rat ratified, uh, signed the genocide convention, but not for example, ratified, because ratifying it requires you to have a law in India on genocide and to which there is resistance. So that, that is not uh, completely um, open to doing that. Uh, India has signed and ratified the CEDAW convention but having done that, they have, uh, uh, while they have done that, they have expressed reservation to several aspects of the CEDAW Convention, thereby not fully committing to implement all aspects of the CEDAW uh, declared, uh, you know, convention. And uh, women, peace and security, well, um, no, India has no implementation plan. There is no national plan, action plans for implementation of 1325. And uh, I believe perhaps that is because India does not consider itself a country in conflict and therefore in need for any implementation of uh, women, peace and security, which as uh, you know, we, we know practitioners here in India would, would dispute against. There are several Indian, uh, there are several places where there are internal conflicts where uh, if not direct national action plan, the standards set by these plans, the standards provided by the, these the women, peace and security resolutions can be, even if it is selectively implemented, it can help. So what I'm saying is that even if India doesn't 
you know, implement a national action plan on 1325 uh, or does not follow up on any of the women, peace and security resolution, but takes the standards that these resolutions sets and brings in policies to uh, implement those in India without in any way, you know, think that itself should help. But that also uh, has not quite happened. The same with the International Criminal Court process. India has not signed nor ratified the criminal court uh, process. And therefore, uh, you know, there is it, it's not binding on, on India. So the, uh, the Indian government's approach to implementation of some of these human rights and uh, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, you know, resolutions, declarations, conventions are, are mixed. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we have caste question. Caste. the caste question, the caste question with regard to um, uh, implementation of um, the caste question is um, there has been uh, incredible um, uh, advocacy and movement by Dalit groups in India. National Within, Alliance of Women's Organization, Dr. Yeah, Ruth Dr. Yeah. Ruth Manavam, they and other Dalit organizations also have done incredible advocacy at the United Nations and achieved what I believe is, is a very, uh, very good um, uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, noting in, in uh, and uh, noting by the Committee on Race Discrimination. Uh, which was meeting in South Africa some years ago, I feel quite a few years ago, I'm not sure, eight to 10 years ago. And these are advocates, advocacy by Dalit groups lobbied the CERD, which is called the CERD Committee, Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, to include that the uh, racial discrimination that this committee uh, is, uh, is talking about includes caste. And therefore, and, and the committee uh, did make that intervention and clarification in, in the South Africa, which is now part of the law of the third committee. So where, where India raised strong objection to say that caste and race is not the same, whereas the third committee in its explanation provide detailed explanation of how they are parallel, the race discrimination and the caste discrimination in respective you know, places where it happens, the US primarily and India follow the same trajectory. These are also century old, old uh, discrimination that uh, you know has still has impact and continues in various ways similarly the caste discrimination here in india it talks about the parallels between these two kind of uh, discrimination and um, if you want to know about how uh, how this caste discrimination has been um, has been uh, equated to race discrimination i would refer you to an article in a book that I co-edited with uh, a colleague. And the book is called Pursuing Elusive Justice, um, um, Mass Crimes in India and Relevance of International Standards. In that, there is a, there is a chapter on caste, this persecution on the basis of caste that basically puts together both the race discrimination in US and caste discrimination in US and explains how, explains the parallels between them and is the similar kind of parallels that the third committee uh, used and declared that these, uh, that the race, when, when the third committee use, uses the word race discrimination, it means and includes caste discrimination. So at international level, you know, that is a significant success by the Dalit groups here in India. Um, I, I do not see that there, you know, there is a lot of, um, how do you call it, protections for, for caste-based, against caste-based discrimination in India or caste-based prejudice in India, both at state and national levels. But the fact remains that those implementation uh, leaves a lot to be desired because day in and day out, you see uh, uh, you see reports of uh, caste prejudice pre prevailing in the society, caste discrimination, violence on the basis of caste. Why yesterday or day before we saw another rape case in UP of uh, yeah of two with girls being raped and hanged in trees. So despite all the protections that the state of for caste discrimination persists, and uh, and uh, you know it it 
and, and the, the Dalit groups are seized of the matter. They do lobby the, for example, the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights. There are several cases that have been sent over there. There are several reports that special rapporteurs as of violence against women, as well as on, on, um, on the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights have questions the Indian government uh, about it, about these caste prejudice and discrimination. But this is an ongoing process and it, it simply needs to be to continue. Um, until until it takes effect at some point. Would you like um, to give your concluding remarks, Dr. Vaida, uh, whether this exercise of working at a global level, is it worth it? Are we getting any, is there any sign of optimism uh, to, to pursue uh, and invest one's energy? Because we all have said that uh, uh, think, uh, think globally, act locally. So how can we uh, as citizens contribute towards this effort? Um, well, I, I would say that uh, I would not say that there is any, uh, you know, uh, exclusivity that one should work only locally or one should work only globally. I believe there is there is a synergy between these between working at these two levels. The reason why the global work felt important to me is because of one's experiences, you know, that you take from the local. The, the advocacy that I was part of at the International Criminal Court consists of advocates and women's caucus members from around the world who had experience working locally prosecuting crimes against women. And it is that local experience that feed into the international level to make policies at the international level. And when those policies at the international level are made, and, and you have the success that we had with the International Criminal Court, which then gets reflected in the courts working in conflict countries back where they are prosecuting these cases. So I believe there is kind of a necessary synergy between the two. And, uh, and it cannot be an either or question. Um, uh, and the same I feel on women, peace and security and uh, the critiques that that uh, that have been made by right, rightfully made by feminists that uh, uh, you have to have these resolutions on women, peace and security, but at the same time continue to critique because it is these critiques that feed into the continuing process of advocacy on women, peace and security and the incremental advances that will be made will at some point be reflect reflect the critiques that are that are coming in coming in so um so i think you know the the answer would be that there is a need for that, that there is exist a synergy between between work at the lo local and global uh, level and uh, both are equally important um, and and whoever can make difference at whatever level um, you know should should continue to do that and um, and uh, with that, I think I would like to just conclude my remarks. It, it, is, it has been a great pleasure being here and, and being part of this session. I thank the organizers again for organizing this very important session and for having me as a speaker. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I liked your point about uh, making incremental advances. I think that's what the women's movement over the last 200 years has been doing. And I think because, and the whole very powerful wall of the patriarchy, patriarchy and misogyny has been challenged by the collective endeavor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vaida Nayanar. You have demystified the functioning of UN Security Council and also scrutinized its action using gender lens. UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, which was passed in, two, in the year 2000 on women, peace and security was the first U U UN resolution to recognize central role of women as change agents in contributing to international peace and security, which gave a person like you, the, you must be a young woman at that time, uh, to, to be active in the International Criminal Court and your collective wisdom taken seriously. You said that there are 30, 34 women from all over the world who were represented in this uh, advocacy efforts. Since the adoption of resolution 1325, nine subsequent resolutions have been emphasized as Dr. Vaida told us in detail about uh, what are the implications of these resolutions, the importance of putting women at the heart of peacekeeping, peacemaking and peace building, the implementation of WPS agenda is also one of the eight priority commitment areas of the Secretary General Section for Peacekeeping Initiative. She told us about the two, two types of reports that where, where the information and the data comes from the ground level reality at the local uh, at the nations uh, at the at the local level in the different nation states. 
An official acknowledgement of conflict-related sexual violence refers to rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, and forced sterilization, forced marriages, forced pregnancy, trafficking in person when committed in a situation of conflict for the purpose of sexual violence and exploitation, and any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity perpetrated against women, men, because we have seen in case of Syria, even the male prisoners, they were sexually violated and brutal and perverse uh, kind of uh, violence was inflicted by the women soldiers. No, So that is also uh, very important to understand. And also okay, girls and boys, uh, like that is directly or indirectly linked to the conflict. So in the year 2000, the Security Council uh, has made this change and at least official acknowledgement of these painful lived experiences. Uh, this was the first resolution to recognize differential and disproportionate impact of conflict on women and girls and affirm the importance of women's participation as active agents in peace, not only being perceived as a victims, we need, victims in need of protection. No? Uh, and also the security processes women should have say. The resolution introduced four pillars or priority areas of WPS agenda. Participation calls for women to participate equally with men in peace, political and security decision-making processes at na local, national, uh, regional and international levels. Protection to seek, uh, uh, see, this protection seeks to ensure that women and girls' rights are protected and promoted in conflict-affected situations and include protection from the uh, gender-based violence. Uh, prevention refers to the pre prevention of all forms of violence against women and girls in conflict-affected situations and includes the fight, uh, fighting impunity and involving women in conflict prevention. Security Council has adopted 10 resolutions uh, right from uh, the year 2000 to 2019. And the term WPS is used to highlight the linkage between women's roles and experiences in conflict and peace and security. So obligations in this resolution extend from international to local level and include intergovernmental organizations such as uh, and the United Nations, national governments, and WPS mandates uh, are the blueprint for all the work conducted on gender in peace operations. So another very important dimension is that of a relief and recovery focus, uh, recovery which focuses on meeting women's and girls' specific humanitarian needs and reinforcing women's capacities to act as leaders in relief and recovery. So I think this uh, this has been a very, very educative and uh, very important uh, intervention which Dr. Vaida Nainar has made to expand our horizons of human uh, liberty, human freedom uh, in the context of conflict and uh, uh, both it, uh, at the national level and in the domestic arena. Thank you very much. And now Imprit team can take over. Thank you so much, Mom. Um, I'll start off with, um, as we come to an end of session two on gender dimensions of UN Security Council, of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order, organized by FES India office and IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, GISC. I, Tripta Behra, researcher, IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks we are grateful to our expert for the day two of this monsoon school, Dr. Vahida Nainar. Thank you so much, ma'am, for an excellent presentation and interaction. We thank our chair, Professor Bhuti Patel, and conveners, Ms. Jyoti Rawal, and Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. Arjun Kumar. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. We look forward to welcoming you on September 23rd at 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time for our third day of this online school, Monsoon School, on the topic Gender and Sustainable Development Discourses by Professor Roxana Marinescu and Professor Vibhuti Patel. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in in the future to our IMPRI web policy talk 
and web policy learning. Wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.